This is me, looking quite uh, pensive, I guess. So I'm, I'm a lovely guy, I promise. Um, I'm originally from Coventry. Any people from Coventry in here? I know Mo's from Coventry. Woo! A couple more. It's odd. Um, and I live in North London. Uh, any North, North London people here? Look at that. The energy in this room, mate, is... Woo! Something else today. Um, look, the main thing is, for me, is I like travelling and eating. I was thinking about my hobbies. I don't know if they're hobbies, but I like doing them, so that's, that's me. Um, my professional life, um, I started out at Coventry City Council. Uh, I moved to London and then started working at the University of the Arts. Um, I then moved to the Ministry of Defence in Whitehall. I spent a long time there, and we can talk about that in a little bit. I moved to a little startup after that. There was about 10 of us. Um, some really interesting learnings there that I'll come on to. Uh, I then moved to the BBC to look after the news app. Uh, maybe some users in here, I don't know, but it's quite a popular app. Uh, and then I moved to Spotify, where I am now. Um, it's, I, I was trying to demonstrate there that I uh, have a, a varied experience, varied team size. I've worked with teams that are really small, really big, big organisation, small organisation, boring organisations like the Ministry of Defence and some exciting ones like Spotify. Um, there you go, look, some photos there. Ministry of Defence, BBC um, and Spotify. And there's a ship there, partly because I like shipping things. I don't like ships. It's just solely around getting things out the door, but I couldn't find a good photo for it, so that's the best I've got. Um, and then what I like doing is creating high-performing teams. So uh, I was thinking, what are good teams? The All Blacks are pretty good at rugby, let's be honest. So what I want you to imagine throughout this whole talk is the All Blacks, but sort of like software development style. So... I'm not going to describe that to you, but I'm sure you've got your own, your own images of what that would be. So, Okay, so high-performing teams. A little bit of context before I start. I'm here today to talk about agile, high-performing teams uh, and how we meet our goals at scale. Why is that and why am I focusing on high-performing teams? Well, to be quite frank and simple about this, I don't think you can achieve uh, scaled goals or goals uh, without high-performing teams. It's as simple as that for me. So the some context for this is, uh, at the minute I'm working at Spotify, I work in quite a big product area, uh, and I look after, if you use the app, you'll probably know them, but I look after the library, so where you put your songs, I look after the playlists, all those playlists you're making, I look after home, so the big home feed, and I look after some other stuff, but that's the main stuff. Um, and I would say I joined 10 months ago, I started with six teams, and I've scaled to, we've scaled to 17 more recently, so that's about, we're looking after about 350 people. Um, which is a nice, a nice number to talk about scale. Um, and I would say that the complexity or intensity of working at Spotify is still quite similar to working at a startup, which is quite small. It's quite, I'm dealing with a lot of incoming on a daily basis. I'm sure you all are as well. But I'm dealing with problems every minute, every hour, every day. Um, and that's where I spend a lot of my time. So I hope you'll find a lot of this relatable. Um, it's a lot of theory. It's a lot of... Uh, examples, it's a lot of ideas um, that I hope you'll absorb, like, have questions about, and I think there's time for a questionnaire at the end as well, so if you do, then throw them my way. So, high performance. Before I go into this, um, I think we're in a world where we're about to step into another delivery cycle, and what I mean by that is, not, not waterfall to agile, but I think we're, in a sense, looking at core components of agile delivery, we're picking our best ones, uh, from Agile, we're looking at picking our best ones from maybe Waterfall, maybe Safe, and we're just implementing those things. We're not implementing Agile methodology end-to-end -end anymore because I don't think it's that valuable. And I've got, I I've got a, an example here to talk through. The Spotify model. I, I would be very, very surprised if anyone in this room does not know what the Spotify model is. Um, but it, the principle was around organisation of having squads, chapters, Guilds, engineers doing great things, delivery people doing great things, et cetera, et cetera. Now, the truth about that model is it is a good model. It's a good model for organization. But as, as, as an organization sc uh, scales, this started to get a little bit stressed. Um, and what it encouraged was, at the time, which was autonomy, which everyone loves, self-management, um, less formal process, and it was built for a less complex time. That's... And it worked, and it probably works for some of your organizations. Um, but now we're moving into a world where Spotify isn't 1,000 people, it's 9,000 going on 10. We need something else to support this model, and that's what I'm going to talk to you through just now. So this isn't a 
Spotify, you know, certified methodology. This is one of the models that I'm using at the minute, but the organizational structure there is good, um, but you need to think about other core components, and I encourage you all to think about the core components of the methodologies you're using that are relevant to your organizations today. So the, th the, um, the methodology or the equation here that I want to talk through, and I'm going to use the presentation to talk through this today, is around having good, healthy team culture. You add some good goals to those, and we're going to talk through that. You divide that or you consolidate that around good, healthy decision making, and you bundle that up. You bundle all that up and you multiply it by good, solid, strong communication. And what that gets you is two things. One is it achieves the goals you all want, goals at scale, and the other one is you meet the expectations that you collectively set. And that is fundamentally underpinned by good, strong data points that we're going to talk through in a minute. And I can share all this with you all later as well. That's the model we're using. Um, it's the model that I'm implementing currently. There's some good learnings. I'm just going to talk through this model today. Um, if you've got any questions, throw them my way. OK, so first one is aims and goals. So when you're setting up small teams, for me, there are three things you're going after. You want your goals to be achievable. And when you're a small company, it's pretty easy, I'd say. You either want to do something or you want to move something or attack a metric of sorts. Um, so it's easy to have achievable metrics that mean something to you. Number two is having a sense of meaning. People join small organizations because they care about what you're doing as a business. So whether that's climate change, music, I don't know, defense, whatever. But the meaning means a lot to people. People join you because they care about what you're trying to do. And autonomy and agency. When you're small, you can do a lot of things on your own. You're not, you're not dependent on people. You can just get on with it. You can move things. You can build things. And you have the agency to, to do that as well, which is, which is, which is really good. But I think when you scale, these thing, three things change. So achievable goals change at Spotify for us to scaled goals. And what do I mean by that? So the thing I'm doing here is demonstrating a methodology that Jira uses, which is um, about Jira epics and stories and super epics. And we really spend a lot of time talking to people about what we're trying to achieve here. So our bets in the organization are the big things we're trying to do as an organization, whether that be... I don't know, audiobooks, national security, BBC News, whatever. It's the big thing you're going after. The initiative in the work stream, that's like your new thing that you want to do. Do you want to go after a new market? Do you want to go after a new feature? The two in the middle, the super epic, that's your big feature. That's the thing you're building this quarter or this month. And then the two below that are your like, team-specific things, your Jira epics and your Jira stories. Now, the Jira stories for the team is actually quite easy. People like just having a list of things that they want to blast through, get through, and tying that up to uh, your, your company bet or your initiative, the thing you want to do, isn't that hard? Because people know where you want to go. If you're in Spotify, for example, for example, you're building music or you're building podcasts or you're building something like that. It's the bits in the middle. And the, and the learning for me here is that the super epics, the features you're trying to build, and the Jira epics, the things your team own, that's where you spend 90% of your time at scale. Because people don't like sharing things. It's weird. It's so weird. People like owning their own feature and just getting on with it. And when you've got like 20, 30, 40 teams working for you, that, doesn't, that does not happen anymore. So I would say I'm still learning for this. I would say you will all learn from it. Spend your time on Super Epics and Jira Epics, but have some good understanding of how you ladder up from the teams to what you're trying to do and spend good, solid time on that. One way of doing that is understanding the why. So meaning changes to... Why the hell are we doing what we're doing? Some of the work we do is really boring. It just has to be. It's back-end stuff. Sorry if you're... <laughs> sorry if you're doing back-end stuff, man. Like, I do not enjoy back-end stuff. But some people do. Um, I've shot myself in the foot. Don't record that. Um, the back-end stuff is, is you know, it's not, some people don't like doing it. So, and other people like doing the sexy stuff. But understanding the why is really important. So I think it's really important to have people around you that can explain these two things. And I say usually a director of engineering or a director of product, but really strong people can do this. Amazing things are often made of tiny little pieces. And people that, people that do that and explain that on a regular basis are the people that do really well. And I, and I asked my product director, uh, how do you explain these things? He always uses this one, which is a cathedral. There are four things here, there are four layers that need to happen, that need to be done to make the, the monument to God. But it's the way that you sell it. 
Building a wall is important because you have to lay bricks to, to get a wall. To build a cathedral, you need four, five, six, seven walls. It's really, really important that they get built correctly. And the cathedral is essentially a sort of vision for God. And constantly going after those uh, four things when you're a big organization is really, really important. And I found even when I was in the Ministry of Defence where the mission is, is national security, doing things for the UK, it's still not passionate. You're still not very, it doesn't travel down the, down the, um, down the layers of the organisation. So explain the why, understand the why, and get your seniors to be telling you why the hell you're doing it, is my, is my ask. Um, autonomy and agency. I think we're going to hear more about this later on in the other talks. So I'll be interested to see what people say. I don't think it's achievable. And I think it in big organisations, especially as you scale, it's more important to spend your time on your dependencies. And in Spotify, we do a lot of dependency work. We do not, 80, 90% of our, again, of our engineers' times is spent working out which teams they speak to, why they're doing it, what they're doing it, and trying to align. And the reason we do it is, you know, we have one app at Spotify. It covers podcasts, audiobooks, whatever else is coming in the future. It's complicated. It's really, really complicated. It can never go down. And that's why we spend our time on dependencies. There's hundreds of teams doing things on the app, going to one release, going into one app that goes to the Apple, Apple Store or the Android Store every single week. So we spend a lot of time on dependencies, and we do the complex stuff so the user doesn't have to. That's our lot one line of that. And there's three things. I don't know what time I'm on here. I'm not going over. Um, the three, so well, these are the three big th the things. And I think if you go for those three things, what you get is predictability and trust. And I put it in a yellow, it's supposed to be gold. It's the holy grail for me of scale goals. Predictability and trust. Predictability, why? Well, you need to know what your teams are doing. If you've got 10 of them working underneath you, 30 of your working, not underneath, with you, and around you, whatever, you've got to have some sense of what's going on and when they're churning things out. And it's really important to go after that. You're never going to get it perfectly. You're never ever going to say they're going to deliver on a Monday or a Friday. Having a sense of achieving predictability is really, really important. And that is relying on data, which we're going to come on to later. Trust is the second thing. I've never, ever found a, a substitute for this. Whatever, how many people I've looked after or I'm working with. You have to have a good understanding of what the people are saying to you is actually true. Because if it's not, or you're worried that it's not, you spend days working out whether that person has said what they've said to you is actually true. So building trust at a local level with the teams, with directors, engineering managers, whoever they are, is super, super important, even if you scale. Okay, and there's a go, look. It's not even uh, supposed to jump on a wall, but whatever. Right, next. Um, team culture. Uh, so that was the goal section, that was the plus goal things. I hope I've conveyed to you that it's really important. Team culture. Okay, so I asked, I was thinking about team culture at a practical level, and I thought, well, I'll just do what everyone else seems to be doing at the minute, and ask chat GPT about human culture, which is really ironic, weird, whatever. Anyway, it gave me seven points. Seven very practical points, actually. Clearly, uh, clearly communicating, open communication, leading by example, the ones you are all doing and all telling your teams. But I thought it was quite interesting to ask a uh, machine the best ways, and it's, it's come out with the ones that we all do every day. So how do you do that to get well, one thing I wanted to say was, before I go into this, you can, whatever size of organisation you're looking after, however many people, however many teams, you can put whatever processes you want in place, but if you've got a bad team culture, it's dead in the water. It's not going to happen. And I'm a high trust kind of guy. I've got some all right jokes, as you're hearing today. I've got some pretty bad ones that you might hear later. But broadly, I'm a high trust guy. I like speaking to people. I like talking to you about what you're doing. And I like building good, strong cultures wherever I am. And... I just wanted to make a point that we can all talk about perfection and delivery perfection, but it means absolutely nothing if you don't have trust with the people. Next one. Safe spaces. This is hard. So one, what I'm going to talk about here are three things I'm actively putting in place in our team in Spotify at the minute. The first one is safe spaces. A lot of people seem to be talking about this at the minute. Safe space. So are we in a safe space? Can you and I be a safe space? Blah, blah, blah. You can't just say it. It just does not happen. You can't say this is now a safe space. This is, underpins that sort of culture each, each process for breakfast. You have to build avenues and ways to do it at scale to understand what makes people tick. And there is no substitute for that. The three practical ways we're doing it at Spotify at the minute is, number one, the directors write a week note um, for the team. What's gone, what's, what's been good, what's been bad, what's going on. And a lot of personal stuff in there. Um, when I write it, I can't think why anybody would want to know what I'm doing at the weekend, but people do. So 
I put a bit about what I'm doing at the weekend. People like it, people engage with it. And it allows you to connect with people, three, 400 people, very, very quickly. And the point of doing week note is it's consistent. The second thing is something that we do called small hands. I tried to find a small hands thing, but it looked really weird. So we, did, we do a small hands once a month. A small hands is led by the people and everybody that's doing the work, and they set the agenda of what, what's gonna happen for that hour. They engage with people in the organization, they talk about things, it's more informal, it's not one-way traffic, management is doing this, you're doing that. It's just a safe space to chat about cool, good things. And in a virtual world, we found it really, really useful because you don't have the opportunity to do this. So I'd recommend you do a small hands if you're not doing it already. And then the third one we have is an all hands, the actual all hands, where we talk about boring work stuff. But they're the three things that we use to create safe spaces, and it seems to be working. Second thing is maturity models. My question to all of you is, do you know what good looks like for you and your teams? The answer from most people is no. They don't really know what they're going after, they just know it's better than what they've got now. And I would say, at Spotify, at the minute, myself and my, my, my fellow uh, colleagues spend a lot of time thinking about the teams we've got, where they are, what they're doing, not just from a technology or a product perspective or design perspective, but just how they are as people, do they gel, how we form the teams, how are they interacting with the teams, what are they managing. And we, we don't put a number on it, we just give a scale. Good, bad, slightly good, slightly, you know, whatever, some sort of scale that works for you. And I'd recommend that you do all that as well because it gives you some sort of loose basis to move from or move to. And then you'll, you'll, you'll understand how far you, are for, you far off you are from what good looks like. So we do a lot of that. I've got a lot of maturity models that I, I use, I've used previously, previous organizations and also Spotify. So if that is of interest to you, then give me a shout after and I can, I can share those with you as well. There's a lot online. And the third thing is rules create routines. And what I mean by this is not teachers, not rules like don't, don't put your pants down in class. You're talking about rules that are like building, building Lego models. This is not in Spotify is important because the engineers set the tone from the start. You can't, if you're gonna build a Millennium Falcon, you can't just stick some big truck wheels on it and expect it to fly in the same way. So we have a set of engineering rules, product rules, design rules, operational rules that we all work to on a daily basis. They're not boring, they're just guardrails about how we build and what we're gonna, what, what we're gonna build. And it's important to really spend time thinking about that um, because often a lot of people will bring truck wheels to your Millennium Falcon and you have to tell them at the last stage that it's not gonna work. So getting ahead of that early is really, really important. And then, what else have I got on this slide? Uh, don't be a plonker, that was a big one. This is actually really hard and it is quite funny, but it's also really true. This is really difficult to deal with at scale, I find, because people have got different things they want to do, things they want to achieve, people behave differently. And I just wanted to draw attention to that if you attack the transparency, being personable, you have good, clear rules in the organization that you're trying to, to operate within, you have a sense of what you're trying to build, then actually this becomes a lot easier to deal with. And without those other two things, this is a nightmare, and it can completely derail what you're trying to do. So don't be a plonker. Right, so that's team culture. I'm going to move quick. Um, this is about accurate data points. This is a little bit, this isn't as good as the other slides, but we'll go for it. When you're small, actually, uh, the information uh, of what you're trying to do is quite easy. You try to move from A, you're going to go to B, you're going to go to C. You're going to inflate the price of your start of your company. You're going to do something interesting. It's quite easy to deal with. But when you scale, and when you're trying to achieve your, uh, achieve your goals, there are two things for me that are really important. And they are active data and passive data. And I think it's really, really important to distinguish between the two. So passive data for me is the data that as you grow, you just accumulate. How to build things, how to build a team, how to plan, how to do things. The things you say really often the things you tell new starters, the, t t the things you tell your leaders, that stuff is consuming. It consumes all of you, it takes forever, and actually the benefit of what you're trying to get from it is pretty low. So the thing we've done at Spotify, we spend a lot of time on Confluence. We build big, strong information wikis about how you plan, how you build things. We record videos, we do seminars every now and again, we record those, and it's all on this one spot. It's very clear, very easy to navigate. So when you have 350 people, 400 people, 
Um, okay, I'm going to have to move on. Um, not so I was flashing a five minute time in the back. Um, look, passive data, it's boring. Get it written down somewhere so you can maximize economy of scales here um, and get people looking at things rather than telling them. And focus your time on active data. Active data is unblocking things, um, doing good processes. It's the stuff that is going to make your business or your company or your department or your organization move quick and put your time on this data, not the other one. So we've got teams here, team one, team two, team three. I've noticed when you have a, uh, when you start to scale, they sub-optimize for themselves. In Spotify, for example, we have one team using Asana, team two uses Jira, and team three could use um, Monday.com. You waste your time trying to translate between different tooling. So the quicker you can standardize and harmonize, the better. Um, and you can spend time not translating, not focusing on the boring stuff, and focusing on the stuff that is really going to move your business forward. This is where we've seen a lot of wins recently. Um, really, really thinking about the information that you're putting out there often and the things you focus on. So that's that. Uh, harmonize and analyze data everywhere. Right, comms. Comms, as you know, you can all see, I love to talk. Um, more people create more comms. There is, so when you scale, and someone put this uh, to me recently, the top left, when there's three people, there's only three lines of comm uh, communication. At the bottom right, when there's 14, there is 91. Highlights very acutely to me that when you're in a, when you're in a scaling organization, comms has to be conscious. It has to be something you do with purpose. You own it. You own the messaging. Otherwise, people, people get really annoyed really quickly. So just think about the messaging you're putting out there. Think about who it's coming from, how often you're doing it, and spend a lot of good time on that. How we do it at Spotify, we use a method called 4x4s. How we at Spotify, how I at Spotify do it, uh, is a method called 4x4s. You, some of you might know it already, and sorry if, I'm, if you do. Um, it is a meeting that happens every two weeks between the four discipline leaders, so that's product design in, in engineering and insights, and ops is always there, um, in the squad, and uh, the product insights design engineering person in the team. And they meet every two weeks. It's our quad leadership group. It forms really tight, strong bonds with the people, so the com communication is trusted, it's predictable, it's strong, it's stuff you can do information with. Um, and this basically is a scalable model. It goes up all the way. And we are using that at the minute in a team of about, like I said, 350 people. We, as people at the top or people in uh, direct positions are obviously on the top of that pyramid. People in sort of um, squad group leadership or team leadership groups are in the middle and your teams are at the bottom. What it gives you is a very, very tight controlled approach to communication. Which, um, which, is, which is that. Uh, the other thing on that is, the other, the other thing I was gonna say is when you scale, like really look at the meetings you're having on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, draw it out on a whiteboard, work out who's there, what the actual value is. I do it every, every month I will look at what's going on, trying to understand where the cadence is, where we're wasting time. It's a really boring administrative thing to do. But actually, if you look at it often, you'll get real value eventually because you'll start culling the meetings that you don't need. Um, and at scale, that's really important because otherwise you end up working. Silly hours. Okay, this is my last slide now. How long have I got? Five minutes? No, no. Are you good? Cool. Whew, it's hot. Right, uh, decision making. So I've talked through most of the, uh, the elements of the model. One thing that I thought would be interesting is where I spend most of my time on that, this model. And I think 95% of my time is spent in decision making, which is the right thing, actually, because that's the way that this, this all, our department or organization is going to move forward. I spend time on decision making on alignment. Big scaled organizations often have two or three versions of basically the same thing. So you seek them out, work out what they're trying to achieve, and either bring them together or align them in, a, in, in some sort of way. So I spend a lot of time on alignment. Okay, risk. Um, risk is a big one. Um, I spend, of that night I spent, I spend absolutely loads of time just managing risk. Culturally, uh, in the organizations I've been in, uh, risk is like a fear of failure thing. People don't want to tell you about risk because they think they're failing as a person or an individual. So what they do is they go after the easy problems, they do the easy problems. This is an engineering design and, and product. And the hard ones get pushed to the right really, really aggressively to the right, towards the end of the month or the quarter, and then they get carried over. And in one of the teams in Spotify that I worked for recently, I noticed that they were doing exactly that. 
Um, we had to get into the weeds. We had to understand what, what the risks were. Why were, they, why were they pushing them to the side? Well, they thought they'd get fired if they couldn't solve these really hyper-complex problems. So breaking the analogy that risk escalation isn't escalation, it's about a group of people working together on the same problem to achieve goals for the organisation, breaking that understanding down actually was a good thing for us. And we've seen a lot of benefit in our, uh, in our, in our risk management across Spotify. Um, by breaking down the understanding of risk. Don't see it as a side thing, is my point. Just, just consciously spend time on why people are raising risks. Um, and what that gets you is that you don't, you don't waste time. This is the one, one thing that, um, when, I was, when I was working at, in Ministry of Defence and uh, BBC, they spend a, lot of time things on, spend a lot of time on things that they may or may not kill. You know in your heart of hearts if it's going to be a good thing or not. So don't waste time. Spend a good amount of time on things, but somebody create the right environment to kill it off if it's not worth it. Be brave about it and focus your time on the things that are really generating things for your business. Um, that's the model. I'm going to wrap up now because you probably want a beer or something. But the, things you, the two things you get from this is achieving your goals at scale, which is what we're talking about, and meeting the expectations that you collectively set. That's what I thought I was going to end with. But actually, what you get from, from that model, and in big organisations in scale, is you just stack the odds in your favour. That is all you're doing is people and delivery and agile, and agile functions. You're just making some things happen slightly more. And if you're doing that on a daily basis, eventually you get to a position where you have lots of teams that when they say they're going to do something, it's probably more likely that they are going to hit what they say they're going to do. Um, and you as a company will begin to grow and, and move forward in a more effective way. So stacking the odds in your favour is my uh, last bit, um, and if you can get that on a daily basis and work towards that, then you've done a pretty good job. I think that's me. hope that was all right. Thank you for smiling. <laughs> all right.